So in other parts of the world, the situation would be a little bit different. Um, in Africa, there's going to be some specific changes as the Europeans come in. And of course, with the importation and exportation really of slaves uh, and their culture and the blending, you're also going to see China is going to a little bit stay the same, kind of re-entrench their religious and their cultural traditions. And then with India, it unfortunately is a little bit of the same old, same old, where there's going to be this constant or this consistent struggle and strife between the ruling Islamic minority and then the overwhelming Hindu majority. So to start off with here uh, in Africa, the African religious elements accompanied slaves to the Americas. And with this, there's the, the development of Africanized forms of Christianity in the Americas with uh, dream interpretation, visions, spirit possessions. Again, there's cultural blending going on here in much the same way that there's cultural blending that we talked about the other day with the indigenous population of the Americas and specifically Catholicism as it's coming in. So you kind of have that going on here uh, with African traditions uh, as well. Now with the Islamic world, not necessarily a ton is kind of changing. Uh, we're going to see the continued spread of Islam that, of course, is not going to be depending on conquest, but rather wandering holy men, scholars, traders. Uh, you want to put down here next to number one underneath capital A that they offered connections to the wider prosperous world of Islam. And for some, this is what made Islam appealing. There will be, and again, we talked a little bit about this when we dealt with the Ottoman Empire, there's advantages for some people to convert to Islam. Uh, the Muslim traders still pretty much have a monopoly or have a near monopoly on the overland trade. If you want to get in and have some of those connections, it's a lot easier if you happen to be Muslim. The Muslim empires, and particularly the Ottomans, like I've told you before, are really chilled out rulers. As long as you don't cause them any problems and pay the I'm not a Muslim tax, you go about your business. But it is an advantage to be Muslim because one, you don't have to pay the I'm not a Muslim tax anymore. But two, there are some professions, especially within the Ottoman Empire, that are open only to Muslims. So there's opportunity. And for some, that will definitely be appealing. The most well-known, and we do have some reform movements going on here, that will be kind of similar to what we see uh, within Europe. Uh, there's a lot of parallels between this and what Luther does. The most well-known Islamic renewal movement of the period is something known as Wahhabism. In fact, you want to put down here next to number four. Uh, you can actually even just figure it, put it underneath because, you know, like I said before, your notes look a little bit different than my notes. Uh, you want to put underneath number four that there are a lot of similarities between this and the Christian renewal movement. And then guys, go ahead and flip. So just some basic information about the Wahhabi movement. It developed in the Arabian Peninsula in the mid 18th century. And its founder, Allah Wahhab, was a theologian. Again, much the same way that Martin Luther was a theologian. And it was aimed to restore absolute monotheism. Remember, monotheism means worshiping one God and end the veneration of the saints. What they want to do here, and this is where kind of the similarities come in. You want to put this down next to C underneath number four. I mean, realistically, you can kind of put it wherever and through here because it, it is a little bit of a general note. Do you want to put, please, that they wanted to restore 
strict adherence to Islamic law and to end quote unquote foreign influence in Islam. Over time, as Islam has come into contact, especially with Western traders, um, there has been some cultural crossover going over, especially when there's, you know, a lot of similarities of the basic message of both Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. You have some of the Muslim faith, some of the various kind of regional practices of Islam kind of incorporating some of those crossover elements from Christianity. And what the Wahhabists want to do is get rid of that. They want to go back to a pure form of Islam in much the same way that Luther wanted to go back to a more purified form of Catholicism. So under this movement, the state is going to be purified. We're going to get rid of outside influences. And the Wahhabists are going to hang out for a little while. The political power of the Wahhabists eventually is going to be broken at the beginning of the 19th century, but the movement will remain influential in the Islamic world. In fact, when we get to a more modern Islamic reform movement, it definitely is going to be like Wahhabism 2.0. It's going to be the next incarnation. They'll get a lot of their influence specifically from, or a lot of their ideas rather, from the Wahhabists. In China, it's kind of in a weird way, same thing, but we're just taking it up a notch. Um, the Chinese and Indian cultural slash religious change isn't going to be as dramatic as what occurred in Europe. There's not going to be the major division within the religion going on here. In fact, neither Confucianism or Hinduism spread widely in the early modern period. In other words, what you want to do, what you want to put down here next to A underneath number one is they lacked expansion. They lacked expansion. Remember, China is sealing itself off at this point from the Western world. So we're not going out and conquering anyone really that we haven't already had contact with. And same thing with the Hindus. Keep in mind, Hinduism is going to be dominant within India. And don't forget that India at this time is governed by an Islamic uh, group is governed by uh, an Islamic dynasty. So Hinduism is not going to be what will be expanding outwards from there. Um, the Ming and the Qing dynasty in China still operated within the Confucian framework. Again, nothing necessarily kind of new there. Although there is the addition of Buddhist and Taoist thought that leads to the creation of Neo-Confucianism. So... Buddhism and Taoism are far less formal than Confucianism. So as Confucianism kind of starts to adopt some elements from Buddhism and from Taoism, it becomes a little less structured, a little less rigid. There is, however, a considerable amount of debate and new thinking within China. Like, for example, the Chinese Buddhists are going to try to make the religion more accessible to commoners, where withdrawal from the world is not necessary for enlightenment. In other words, you want to put down here next to B underneath number three, becoming a monk is not required. In other words, you can achieve enlightenment without having to seal yourself off and concentrate only on being a Buddhist and reading the teachings of the Buddha and meditating and attempting to achieve enlightenment. There also is within China a very lively culture among the less well-educated. In other words, what you're looking at, you want to put down here next to number four, is religion and culture for the masses. Religion and culture for the masses. And then, guys, go ahead and flip.
in India, again, it's kind of same old, same old. How do we bridge the Hindu-Muslim divide? And there's several movements that bring Hindus and Muslims together in a new form of religious expression. The first one is going to be the Batiki movement, uh, which is going to be a devotional form of Hinduism, where there's the effort to achieve the union sorry, to achieve union with the divine through song, prayers, dances, poetry, and rituals. It's especially going to be appealing to women. Um, They often set aside the caste distinctions. So it's going to be far more open than traditional uh, Hindu society. And this Patiki movement has a lot in common with Sufism. And it helped to blur the line between Islam and Hinduism within India. Uh, You want to put, do you want to underline Sufism? We talked about it before, but it's been a little bit. So underline Sufism and then go ahead and draw an arrow over to the side. I just want to remind you what it is. Do you want to put down Sufism is the mystical form of Islam? This is where believers go out and they kind of try to imitate the life of Muhammad, where they go out and they meditate, hoping that they can get the direct contact with God that Muhammad had gotten. We also see the growth of something known as Sikhism, which is a religion that blends the basic tenets of Islam and Hinduism. Its founder had been part of the Batiki movement and came to believe that Islam and Hinduism were one. That, in a weird way, Hinduism really is a monotheistic religion, and all of the different gods and goddesses within Hinduism aren't really different gods and goddesses. They're different aspects of a singular god. And that singular god is pretty much the exact same god that everybody else is worshipping, predominantly Uh, Sorry, especially Islam. Nanak and his successors are going to set aside caste distinctions because remember, that's the defining feature of Hinduism and is going to proclaim the essential equality of both men and women. So it is very progressive. 